and welcome everybody to the Brody File. Glad you're with us. All right, look, we begin this week with the woman everyone is talking about, Kim Davis. Some love her, some can't stand her, but the county clerk from Kentucky is standing strong after refusing to issue marriage licenses to gay couples because of her Christian biblical principles. She went to jail for her stance and she's now free, but more jail time could indeed be just around the corner because this saga is definitely not over yet. You know, Davis may not be the perfect candidate to stand for biblical marriage. I mean, considering she has been married three times, but after giving her life to Jesus Christ, everything changed. She is indeed a forgiven woman. And we spoke to her here in D.C. with her lawyer, Matt Staver, by her side. How does it feel? I mean, to just be out of jail. I mean, how does that feel? Oh, praise the Lord. <laughs> it's, uh, I feel very, uh, very blessed. Um, you know, uh, the word says we have to consider it all a joy um, to be in service for the Lord. And, and uh, that's exactly, you know, I have a, a peace in my soul and a joy in my heart that uh, nothing of this world can take away. Were you ex not expecting this, but when this first started uh, the, uh, back at the county clerk's office, did you expect all of this to kind of happen like this and it just becomes such a, more than just a media sensation, but this whole huge religious liberty fight? No, I just, I couldn't have imagined in a million years that I would be here in this position with all of everything that's been happening and uh, it's just all very overwhelming. Some people call it a whirlwind, but I call it a firestorm. And that's, you know, I'm thrust in the midst of a fire. And, uh, but that is how my God will purify me and, and, and you know, bring me about to, to be stronger and, and, uh, and more faithful, so. Mm. Tell me a little bit about what it was like uh, in that jail cell. And what, what was life like for you? Well, I was by myself and actually I was very blessed. Um, I got to read the Word, I got to pray a lot, I got to study the Word, uh, did Bible studies for myself and uh, would walk around and raise my hands and, and sing praises to the Lord and to the tops of my lungs. I know the people and they probably thought I was crazy, but, uh, but that's okay, you know. In every situation, I, I don't want to let my situation dictate my joy in the Lord. So no matter where I'm at and no matter what's going on, he always needs to get the praise and the glory because, you know, he is worthy. I love that. Um, tell me that. Tell me about that day, that day that you found out that you were getting out of jail and take me through the process. What, how did you find out and what happened from that point? Well, I had gotten a shower that morning and was cleaned up and ready to, uh, I thought I was going to have visitation. I, they, it was on a Tuesday and they don't even have visitation on Tuesday, but they had lined up about four people to visit me. So I was getting dressed and prepared for that, and uh, they came to my door with the bag of what I had put my clothes in originally from that Thursday, and they had a piece of paper in their hand. And they said, uh, I got an order here from Judge Bunning to release you, and I said, do what? <laughs> and they said, I have an order here from Judge Bunning to release you, and I said, let me see that. So I took the paper, and I went, woo-hoo, you know, praise Jesus. And, uh, and then they said, yeah, there's a condition on it that you uh, don't interfere, you know, with the issuance of license that your deputies have been doing while you've been incarcerated. I said, well, I'll just stay here then. Mm -hmm. And they said they couldn't keep me because the order, they didn't have any authorization, you know, to keep me. So um, I got dressed and went out and just meeting everybody, uh, you know, was just um, such a humbling experience that there were so many people there gathered, you know, to support me and and uh, this cause that we're all in the midst of, you know, because, you know, this isn't just, I mean, this isn't about Kim Davis. It, it is <laughs> much larger than I ever uh, could possibly be. It's, uh, it's, it's about each and every one of us, uh, Christians and, and people who, uh, who are maybe talking to the Lord but haven't committed their life to Him. You know, there's a lot at stake here. And uh, so just to see all those people that support uh, the idea of, of religious liberty and, and the freedom to practice uh, your religion was just overwhelming. It was, it was like walking out and then electricity just automatically hit you right in the face. You know, just 
covers your whole body. Well, in the podium moment, when you come up on the I mean, what in the motion, what was that like? Oh, I was shaking all over, and they were trying to get the microphone out of my hand, and I just kept a hold of it. And I, was, I guess I thought maybe if they took it, I wouldn't get it back. <laughs> but uh, it was uh, it was a very um, the spirit of God was definitely just all up on me so it was it was good you know what's interesting to me what I've thought about um, God never takes you know so to speak the the, the, the perfect people We're, none of us are perfect but I mean you know here you are you know a, a Democrat so to speak you know and and you know someone that's had some struggles in her life we've all had struggles but that God uses folks like yourself and it what, what, do you ever thought about that just how, how God is just using folks in all different ways and folks that it's all throughout the Bible really. Yeah, I, uh, I, I struggled with I struggled with that myself. You know, why would God of all people choose me with my past to stand up and defend something that I had failed so miserably at in the world? And, uh, and then I have to remember that uh, I'm a new person, you know, when I gave my life to Christ. You know, His blood cleansed me, washed me clean, and um, the old has passed away, and the new stands in front of you. And, um, yeah, I'm a very unlikely person to stand and to defend the Word of God. So. You know, you have those critics out there, so to speak, but, but have you thought about how you just play to that audience of one your audience is God, and you know the critics are what the critics are going to do. Yeah, uh, what people say and what they think about me doesn't define who I am, and uh, so that never has really bothered me. Um, but this, you know, the scripture that keeps coming to my mind um, is, uh, you know, what can man do to me? You know, God did not give me a spirit of fear, but of power and of love and of a sound mind. And that has carried me. That has carried me. And it's Kim Davis on the Brody File. You know, I'm sure we haven't seen the last of this story. A quick little side note. Uh, how about that whole situation with Kim Davis and the Pope? I mean, they met while uh, he was in Washington, D.C., but what actually transpired during the conversation is now the subject of a big debate. I mean, Davis's lawyer says the Pope thanked Davis for her courage and told her to stay strong, and he also said it was a private 15-minute meeting. But the media couldn't quite believe that, that this semi-liberal Pope would be so supportive of Davis. So they pushed the Vatican on what went down, and then came this response. Here we go, Oiga Volt. This is from the Vatican, and it's about the meeting. Quote, the Pope did not enter into the details of the situation of Mrs. Davis and his meeting with her should not be considered a form of support of her position in all of its particular and complex aspects. That from Vatican spokesperson Father Federico Lombardi, no relation to Vince Lombardi. Like a vault. All right, well, whatever the bottom line, Ken Davis, a hero to millions of conservative Christians. All right, when we come back, one-on-one -on -one with Senator John McCain. He's talking about the Iran nuclear deal, and he's not happy about it. Back in a moment. And welcome back to the Brody File, everybody. All right, up next this week on the show, Senator John McCain. He was not happy to see Speaker of the House John Boehner announce his resignation. Clearly, pressure from House conservatives was behind it, and that is something we discussed along with the Obama administration's nuclear deal with Iran. Sure. Speaker Boehner obviously sure. resigning. Uh, my goodness, uh, I don't even know where to begin. What question to ask? What, what, what do you make of this exactly? I think it means that there are problems in the House of Representatives in the Republican Party. Uh, I believe that the lesson from this to all of us should be that we have to sit down together as Republicans, recognize who the adversary is. It's not each other. It's, it's the Democrats. It's uh, the next president of the United States. And we cannot afford another Barack Obama. So we should sit down together and come together. And that means uh, a dialogue, that means meeting in the minds, that means uh, agreeing to a common agenda. And it's not healthy for the Republican Party to see us at odds to the point where the Speaker of the House of Representatives, who was elected, 
uh, has to has to resign. I happen to be a great admirer and friend of John Boehner, uh, so I'm very very sorry this has happened. The Iran nu nuclear deal. Um, what is your biggest concern going forward in terms of if it's a year down the road, two years down the road? What, what, what are some of your concerns and, and potential opportunities here, or are there any opportunities here at all? I see no opportunity except you're giving $100 billion or more to the Iranians who are now in control in Yemen, Syria, Iraq, and Lebanon. They're giving arms to the Taliban in Afghanistan. They're on the move everywhere. The world's greatest sponsor of terror. Uh, the Ayatollah uh, recently said, death to Israel, death to America. It's an existential threat to Israel. And I could go through the verification and many of the other arguments that I know our viewers are familiar with. But this is a bad deal. I hope I'm wrong. I pray that I'm wrong. Because what I see is an escalation to the point where all the other nations in the region are going to go nuclear and it'll be a tinderbox. Mm -hmm. And finally, uh, all I can say is that there is a small human dimension to it. There's four Americans being held, held in prison in Iran, for, for, including a reporter for the Washington Post, for no reason. You know, we'll talk about all these other issues, lifting restrictions on conventional weapons, ballistic missile capability, et cetera. But we didn't demand the return of four innocent Americans. That, that shows you the, the desperation that John Kerry and the president had to get an agreement. What about this Corker Cardin bill? I mean, it is the law of the land, so to speak, and uh, it does call for these side deals to, to, to be present. Are, are you, I know Rand Paul said the other day he believes the president could be in defiance of the law on this. Well, what I think is, what is in, your view? I think he's in defiance of the law, and I, and I believe we should have lawsuits that bring him just as we ought to go to court on this one, because I believe, it's, as you just mentioned, it's in violation of the law that was passed that required a full and complete understanding of all the details of the agreement. John McCain on the Brody File. All right, uh, coming next, President, presidential candidate Mike Huckabee, uh, you know, he has a few things to get off his chest about President Obama and the way he's treating Christians in America. We discuss in a moment. And welcome back to the Brody File. All right, time now for our chat with GOP presidential candidate Mike Huckabee. He is not among the top tier at this point, but he's plugging away. If he can make it to the top five or seven, then we're really going to start to see his excellent debating skills. We did catch up with him recently at the Values Voter Summit as we went into Brody file full stalking mode. Uh, there were some reports about you concerned about, well, I'll let you explain about it, but uh, or talk about it, but this, this idea that President Obama talks about you know, his Christian faith, mm -hmm. but then the principles don't seem to follow. I want you to explain some of what you're talking about here. Well, it's real simple. I mean, this is a guy, he says he's a Christian. He says he believes the Bible, and that's why he's for traditional marriage. Then he says he's not anymore. This is the guy who uh, gets up at the National Prayer Breakfast and criticizes Christianity for something that happened a thousand years ago. He gets up on Easter and has a very harsh tone and really belittles so many of the Christians that he says he's known that he apparently doesn't like. He uh, goes after the Little Sisters of the Poor with his administration, the Green family with Hobby Lobby, all Christians. But while it's, it seems that there's this targeted effort, whether it's through the IRS or through the Justice Department, for Christians, um, doesn't lift a finger to help Kim Davis, an elected official, a Democrat, a fellow Democrat down in Kentucky, but we accommodate Nadal Hassan, the Fort Hood shooter who killed 14 people. We let him grow his beard while he's in jail. We accommodate the Gitmo detainees. We paint a little stripe in their cells. I've been there, I've seen it. We give them prayer rugs. We give them five times a day to pray and halal meals uh, that are far more expensive, three times the cost of the meals that our soldiers eat who guard the detainees. So I, I'm, I'm just looking at the realities here and saying, could you show us a little love here? If, if you really say that you love us and you're one of us, you know, give us a little affection. Right. Scott Walker dropping out of the race and everything. How much does, how much does this field need to be whittled down for you and others to gain some more traction here? Because, boy, there are a lot of folks in this field. There are, but 
that's not necessarily negative. Uh, I mean, this is the Baskin Robbins of the presidential race. People have lots of flavors to choose from, and they're going to do a lot of sampling. That's kind of typical, um, and that's okay. I would love to see another 14 candidates drop out, leaving me on the field by myself. But barring that, I just have to keep working hard, organizing in the early states, and win. That is Mike Huckabee here on the Brody File. All right, look, when the show rolls on, all she wants to do is make floral arrangements in peace. Come on! But instead, her life could be torn to pieces. A conversation about religious liberty with Baronel Stutzman. That's next. And we're back on the big show. It's a huge show. Hey, uh, her name is Baronelle Stutzman. All she wants to do is continue to run her store. It's called Arlene's Flowers out in Washington State. We were there. This is video. This proves it. Anyhow, instead, she's been in a world of legal trouble after refusing to sell flowers to a gay couple for their wedding. This has been going on for a couple years now. It's still in court. And so far, liberal judges haven't been too kind to Baronelle, but she is not backing down from the religious liberty fight. We spoke with Baronelle here in Washington. How are you feeling about this whole process? And this is my Dr. Phil question. <laughs> you know, tell me how you feel about um, how this has affected you. It's, this has been a tough ride for you, hasn't it? It has been an exciting ride and a blessed ride. And uh, I am so thankful for the people that have been praying for us. And uh, God has just been, uh, miracle after miracle has happened. And support of people that uh, never realized, even from the gay community, has come in. So it's just been, uh, I can't say it hasn't been a struggle, but it's been a blessing. You mentioned the gay community. Tell me a little bit about that. I mean, there's been folks that have been, what, just kind of encouraging you a little bit? Or, or what, what's that been like, exactly? Yes, we, we have several gay customers, and we've had gay employees and, and bisexual employees. And we have uh, uh, particularly a, a gay couple that come in, two women, and they've dealt with us for years. And they said, you know, you have every right to do what you're doing, and we will continue to shop here. And when I hear that, that, that makes me uh, it makes me very humble, but it also makes me very thankful. Tell me a little bit about where this all stands now, and I don't, we'll get to the legal part of it in a moment, but I am curious about what your mindset is a little bit about what you do now in the fight and how you kind of keep going. What, what's, what do you think might be next? Do you have any sense of, of how this might play out, or what, 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 are, you, what are you thinking here? Well, I'm, <laughs> I'm not thinking much. I'm just, I, my, my prayer is that whatever God has, he'll prepare us for it. And, uh, you know, I don't know what's coming next, and it really doesn't matter because it's under his control. So uh, wherever he puts me or whatever he brings me to, then it's okay because I know he's in charge. Hmm. Your name, uh, if you type in on Google, because I do this a lot, yeah. Baron L. Stutzman, hero, you get a lot of clicks. There are a lot of entries there. Baron L. Stutzman, martyr you get a lot of clicks because people see you that way. Evangelical Christians see you as someone fighting the good fight. How do you see yourself exactly? Sinner saved by grace. Yeah, I'm not, a, I'm not a hero and I'm not a martyr. I just try to be obedient. Tell me a little bit about the financial impact this either has had on you, potentially will have on you, and how hard that has been. Well, if we lose the government and the ACLU, the attorney fees will be over a million dollars for the ACLU, and it will take everything we own, everything we've saved for, our retirement, our home and our business, because they're also suing us personally and corporately. So uh, we'll possibly lose everything we own. Mm. I know there was a, and maybe I can get your opinion on this in a moment, but I know there was a chance for a settlement, or at least that they, they called it a settlement of some sort where you could what pay a certain amount a fine and then kind of move on, but you held fast. Tell me a little bit about what that process was like when that when the judge kind of talked about that. It was the attorney general that uh, first had a fine of two thousand dollars, and that I continued to do gay weddings, an apology, and we said no to that. And then he dropped it after the settlement came. The judge said that we were guilty and that we had uh, we could be religious, but we couldn't we could have our faith, but we couldn't practice our faith. Mm -hmm. And then they dropped it to $1,000 and a dollar for legal fees. But that's the small part uh, 
the larger part is the ACLU attorney's fees, which will mount up again to over a million dollars. But it's not, it's not about the money. It's about the freedom and, and our stand for Christ. I mean, Christ died for us, and yet I'm not willing to give up anything to stand for Him. Seems, seems a little sad. Mm -hmm. The principle of it all, yeah. Billy, let me ask you real quick, uh, where, where we're at in this process legally a little bit here, I mean, what, what's the road forward at this point? What should people know about the case as it stands today? Well, we've appealed her case to the Washington State Supreme Court, and I think what's important for people to understand is that what's going on here is truly unprecedented. We've never in our country seen an attorney general come after a person simply for standing on what they believe. And it's truly frightening what's happening. They're not only are they suing her in her personal capacity, but her, her, her business, which means she stands to lose everything she owns. And this is frightening for freedom. We should live in a society where the government protects our freedom, where it's freedom's best friend, not its worst enemy. And I think what we're seeing happen to Baronell uh, could happen to a lot of other people if we continue to allow this, this uh, trajectory to continue. All right, we're back, ne ne <laughs> we're back next with a pretty disgusting Oise moment of the week. See you in a moment. Well, look, folks, uh, when you're running for public office, everything you've ever done is going to be outed uh, by the media some, somehow, some way. Sometimes it's downright unfair. Other times, well, it's a situation where the people need to know. Which leads us to this week's Oive Moment of the Week. All right, meet Augustus Sol Invictus. That's, sorry, that's his name. Libertarian candidate for the Florida Senate, 32 years old. He's a lawyer, and <laughs> he once killed a goat and drank his blood. True. That's right. You heard me. I'm not kidding. That's the goat right there. Or maybe it's not the goat. Anyhow, Invictus, who declines to give his real name, by the way, drank the goat's blood as part of a pagan ritual. All right, you want some more? According to Invictus, he has been investigated by the FBI, the U.S. Marshal's Office, and once renounced his citizenship. Like a vault. No need for the media to smear this guy's campaign because that's coming straight from the horse's mouth. All right, well, actually, the goat's mouth. I need an excedrin. That's it. Have a good week, everyone. God bless. Bye. Bye.